Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let's stand together and sing, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. child and forever I am redeemed and so happy in Jesus no language my rapture can tell I know that the light of his presence continually dwell redeemed 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 by the blood of the Lamb His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His child and forever I am. Well, amen and amen. Welcome, welcome. It is a joy and delight to be together in the house of the Lord today. Praise be to God. What a great day to worship Him and to, uh, to lift Him on high and to exalt Him. Praise be to God. Amen. 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 Hey, uh, it is a joy to be together. Listen to what the words of the psalmist. The psalmist says... <clears throat> He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us. You know, I've often thought, what does it mean for God's face to shine on us? I wonder if it doesn't mean that we are recipients of God's smile. That God is delighted. May he be delighted as we express our love to him today. Hey, let's pray. Let's command our morning hymn. God, you're a great God, and uh, Father, we love you. We thank you and praise you for your goodness and your mercy and kindness that is new and fresh to us every day. And God, this day as we gather, we gather with hungry hearts. God, we we want to hear you. We want to know you. We want to know your move and your touch in our lives. And God, uh, God, we know this, that with your blessing and in your blessing there is joy and, and no mixture of anything else and anything less. And God, we're looking for what you have for us and, and what you will in our hearts and our lives. And Father, we want our lives to be pleasing in your sight. God, we want our lives to be honorable to you. And so God, this day, as we gather here in your presence, Lord, I pray that, that our worship would be pleasing in your sight, that God, God uh, our hearts would be soft and tender and malleable in your, in, your, in your hands so that, God, our hearts would be pleasing in your sight this day. God, speak to our lives. We desperately need you, and we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 You may be seated as we continue to worship together. I'm so thankful for his amazing grace and that he loves us and redeems us. Let's sing, Since I Have Been Redeemed. I have a 
song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed. To do His will my highest price since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in His name since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed, dispelling every doubt and fear since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many days
amazing. Let's stand together and let's give him our praise and worship. Let's sing, There is a Redeemer. Let's sing of Jesus this morning. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy And our boys and girls are staying in with us today. There are no children's worship for this service. Well, this morning, let me invite you to turn with me to the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 6. Hosea, Hosea chapter 6. Two weeks ago, we began a series of messages in the book of Hosea. We began looking in chapter 1 at the reality of, of the fact that God is a loving God. God demonstrates His love and calls us and draws us to that love in an incredible and a, uh, an astounding way. And through the picture of the life of Hosea, we see the, uh, uh, the unfailing love of God. Uh, the inconceivable love of God, that God would love us while we're unlovely and rebellious, that God's love would be steadfast and unswerving. God is devoted to those who are His. That's what Hosea speaks to us and screams to us through his life and through his journey. And we looked at that in chapter 1. In chapter 2 last week, we looked at this, that God has promised us that He would take our valley of Achor and turn it into a door of hope. Now the valley of Achor was the valley of trouble. If you remember, that was where Achan rebelled and they knew sorrow and struggle and they knew disappointment and, and they knew defeat. And this is what God has told us, that He takes our valleys of, of trouble and He transforms them into doors of hope. And isn't that incredible? Isn't that astounding as you look at your life and look back at some of those things that you thought were the worst thing in the world that happened to you at the time and as you begin to look and trace the hand of God through those moments how He turns and transforms those troubles into doors of hope. Amen? That was kind of weak, guys. Because that's true. That's profoundly true. Praise be to God. What a great God. Well, this morning we want, us to, we want to talk a little bit about uh, this incredible restoration that God wants to work, this redemption that God wants to work, but He wants to, uh, to invite us to a genuine or to a real restoration with Him. And here in chapter 6, we hear Him speak of that in a very clear and very distinct way. In chapter 3, just for your notes and just so you're uh, kind of uh, keeping track as you're reading through Hosea and studying with us, in chapter 3, Hosea goes to the slave market and buys his wife back and there follow five 
five without statements. And the reality is, uh, in chapter 3 is that there are, there are penalties and prices that our rebellion from God takes. And it causes us to be without some things we long for in life. And what that's designed to do is to drive us to a right relationship with God that God would restore us. But the problem is, if we're not careful, we do that in a hollow way, in an ingenuous way, and we lose the wonder of what God has for us. Let's, uh, let's unpack that out of chapter 6. Follow along with me, beginning in verse 1. Verse 1, he says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us, that He may heal us. He has struck us down, and He will bind us up. After two days He will revive us. On the third day He will raise us up, that we may live before Him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, there are some good moments here in this text of Scripture that promise us of what can be and would lead us to the possibility of a great restoration with God if we have a heart that is sincere, and if we have a heart that is truly seeking Him. Here in this text of Scripture, we see in verses 1 and 2 that Israel's plea is for change. Their cry is for change. Because in verse 1, this is what they experienced, that this distance from God creates destruction in our lives. Distance from God. When we, when we alienate ourselves from God, when we pull back and pull away from God, and we are drifting in our walk with God, all of a sudden that, the reality of what comes in our lives is there comes uh, and ensues destruction in our life. Because God's words and God's commands are given to us for our own benefit. God's will, God's commands, God's words, they're given to us for our own benefits. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, it says this, that God's commands are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. And they're not burdensome. And sometimes we think, boy, to live in the will of God and doing the word of God and, and, and living after what God asks us is sometimes hard. But you know what? It's not burdensome. It leads us into life. God's commands are for our best. They're for our best. I love the words of Jesus in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, Satan has come to rip you off of life, to steal your life from you, to steal everything that God has planned for you. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have that abundantly. The purpose of Jesus' coming was that we might plug into the life that God has destined for us, that God has planned for us, that God has purposed for us, and find in that life everything we're longing for, everything we're looking for, and the richness and fullness that we were designed to experience. Now, if you, if you buy a, a brand new car, let's say you go and buy a brand new car. <clears throat> okay, Pastor Paul is never going to do that because he couldn't stand the shock of 25% depreciation in the first mile okay it's not going to happen in pastor paul's world it's hard for me to even talk about it okay i'm i'm tight but some might say cheap but uh, <clears throat> okay so let's say you buy a brand new vehicle and you pull it off the lot and there's a problem with it what do you do You take it back to the dealer. You take it back to who made it and you say, you make this right. And if the wheels fall off of life, what do we do? We run into the world and see what the world's doing. That's what we do. And we should run to God who created us and made us because he, he wove us together while we were still in our mother's womb. He planned our days for us before there was one of them. And he delighted over what he intended for us. That's how that's supposed to work. Uh, that's, that's how God designed this. Because every time we distance ourselves from God, every time we flee from Him, uh, it, it creates brokenness in our lives and it pulls us away from His best. When we get away from God, it brings pain into our lives. Alcoholism and drunkenness is outside the plan of God. And what does that do? What does it bring? It brings broken homes, broken lives. 
children grow up and they don't know their parents because they're never engaged and we miss our kids creates death on the highways it creates destruction it's just not God's plan anger it's outside of God's plan anger it's outside of God's plan I know it too well it's outside of God's plan and yet given license it produces broken relationships medical problems because you're walking with anger and your blood pressure is elevated at all times and all, all of a sudden you've got all kind of medical problems it, it creates destruction in every element of my life and yet I want to invite it because I feel comfortable with it. And I love those little anger fantasies I have. <laughs> and then I'm going to say, and then I'm going to say. And, and what's that do? It's just destroying me. And yet that's where I go. Because that's the pull of my flesh. When we stray from God, we lose the vitality of life the way God intended it to be. When we stray from God, we lose our moral compass and we lose our moral strength and, and truth gets cloudy. And you know what? Truth is never cloudy in the Word of God. What is right is never cloudy in the Word of God. We lose relationships. As a result, we live in, incarcerated in, 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 in a lonely world because I've strayed from God. I've, I've pulled away from God. I've got to be secretive and quiet about everything. I've got to hide everything in my life. And so all of a sudden, I distance from everybody that's closest to me in my life and, and I'm I'm living a lonely life. We lose purpose and direction. We lose the wonder of life and we simply exist and survive rather than walking in the wonder of what God has for us. Every time we get away from God, we're in trouble. Here in verse 1, the people say, come, let's, let's return to God. We've been torn into pieces, but God will restore us. Let's return to God. And they began that plea incredibly well. Come, let us, let us. The plea for change begins with me. That's a good thing. They began well. They began uh, appropriately. They began with, let, let's, let us do that. Let us do that. Any opportunity to, to see God's move in my life demands my personal responsibility. I, I need to decide, you know, I need to repent. I need to seek Him. I need to follow Him. This is my, my responsibility. We live in a culture that passes responsibility. We live in a culture that, that refuses to take responsibility. We live in a day where we see, where we, if we're going to see the move of God, it's dependent upon our determination to, to decide and determine that I will seek Him. We live in a day where we want to push off responsibility on everything and anything. The problem is the people who don't agree with me. That's the problem. That's the problem. The problem is the political environment of our day. That's the problem. The problem is... Uh, it's how I was raised. The problem is it's in my DNA and that's how I was created and made and it's not my fault because I was made like this. The problem is, the problem is, it's my culture. Everybody does it and I'm the only one that gets caught. The problem is, and it has to start with me. They began well. It, they, it, it wasn't their culture. It wasn't their politics. It wasn't uh, other people's decisions. They said we need to seek him. and They did well. But they fell off the rails. They fell off the rails. Because their cry was for change, not for God. Their searching was for different, not for God. We've got to seek Him, not His. We've got to look for Him, not what He does, not how He blesses, not how, how His hand moves. We've got to look for Him. They were concerned about their, their wounds, not their waywardness. They, their, their cry had only to do with, let's end the pain, let's get out of this. It wasn't, let's end the sin. They wanted the benefits of a relationship without being bothered with the reality of a relationship. You know, if you want the benefits of a relationship, it, it costs you. You know that, right? When you get married, you make a vow and make a pledge. And it starts costing you. And it costs you every day. And there's nothing better in all of life than that, right? Right? That's right. Right, married people? That's right. Nothing better, but it costs you every day. 
because that relationship's sweet and it's worth that cost. It's worth more than that. But some people haven't figured out that it's going to cost you. This is what, uh, this is what the people of Hosea said. Let, let's acknowledge God, but let's not acknowledge our sin. Let's seek after God, but let's not repent of our sin. And that's the problem of, of, that we have in our world. That's a consistent problem in Scripture. In the book of Judges, and we're studying the book of Judges on Wednesday night. In the book of Judges, that's the reality of what happened in the Judges. In the book of Judges, the Judges... The people of God would, would see a great move of God and they'd love that and it'd last for a little while and pretty soon they'd drift away from God. And as they got away from God, God would bring some correction in their life and, and, they'd, and they'd hate that and they, and they would complain and they would, the Bible calls it, they would lament. That means they would complain and they would, they would tell anybody who would listen and they would commiserate together about it and they would do that on and on and on and on and they would lament for 20 years, 40 years and then finally it says, and then they would repent. There's a difference between lamenting and repenting. It's a dramatic difference. Lamenting means you and I get together and we complain about it. Repenting means that I get on my face before God and, and, and just with a broken heart cry out to God and, and, and turn away from some things and turn to some things. That's repentance. And after they would repent, God would raise up a judge. There would be a great deliverance and God would move. But that's consistent in, in all of our walks. In the New Testament, that was consistent. The author of the Hebrews writes to the Hebrews, and he gives them five warning, warning passages in the book of Hebrews uh, that are very clear about our, our walk with God. And the very first one appears in chapter 2, and it says, it says this, we've got to pay careful attention. We've got to pay careful attention lest we drift away. We've got to pay careful attention lest we drift away. I don't know about you, my life, man, it just takes, it, just, it can happen in a day. I can start out the morning and have an, a killer quiet time and be in the Word and be blessed by God and hear from God and have a great prayer time and, 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 and sail into that, that day thinking, wow, this, is gonna, this will be cooking day. And then this happens and then something else happens and pretty soon by the end of the day, I'm in the mully grubs. It's a high technical term, mully grubs. You'll have to look, look that up. You can Google that. I'm in the mully grubs. I don't like anything. Don't like anything that's happening. I don't want to talk to anybody. And man, I drifted. In a day. I'm pathetic, aren't I? Probably takes you guys two days. <laughs> oh, I take that back. I know some of you guys. Takes you guys a day too. That's the reality. We have this proclivity to drift. We need to seek God continually for His heart and for, for our closeness and our affinity to Him. We don't need to seek His blessings. We need to seek God. For He revives and restores. He gives life. It says in verse 2, He gives the winter and the, and the spring rains. He gives everything we need for refreshment. He gives everything we need for supply. God moves in incredible ways, but we've got to seek Him. Not just His not just the things he does. We've got to seek him. Louis XIV, the story told of Louis XIV. Louis XIV went to church one Sunday and he looked around and the place was vacuous. And he talked to his pastor and he said, what's going on? Why, aren't there, why isn't anybody at church today? And Pastor Fenelon, Pastor Fenelon told him, I announced you would not be present today, your majesty. I wanted you to see how many people sought God and how many people sought your favor. We've got to seek Him, not His. Because when we seek Him, God makes things right. 
God makes things in our, right in our lives. God makes things right in our relationships. God makes things right in our community. When we seek Him, God moves in our fellowship. God moves in, in the community in which we live. And God does uh, incredible things that, that will astound us if we seek Him. But we don't we seek His. We don't seek the blessing. This is what we seek. We seek Him. We long to know and press into knowing Him. That's what he goes on to say in verse 3. Longing to know, to press into knowing Him. Urging us here that we might know, that we might press on to know the Lord. The repetition of to know, to know, gives us the, this evidence that there is an intimacy that is desired between us and our God. We need to have an intimacy with our God. The press into is a terminology here in the Hebrew for hunting. You need to hunt it like you're tracking game down. You need to track down so that you know Him, so that you can understand Him and walk with Him and serve Him. We've got to know, press on to know Him. God's response, so, so there's some good beginnings here and then they got off the rails. They began well, they took personal responsibility, they got off the rails. Suddenly they wanted God's blessing. They didn't want God, they wanted God's blessing. They got off the rails. And this is God's response to them in verse 4. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, what shall I, what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall, I, what shall I do with you, O Judah? What shall I do? He goes on to say, how should I respond? How should I act? Your actions are empty and hollow. You make a pretense of seeking me, but it's not genuine. It's not real. What, what do you want me to do? He says, you're like the, he says, your love is fickle. You're like the morning mist. You ever get up early in the morning and see the fog? It's like soup. And when you're not looking, it's gone. You notice that? He says, you're like the morning mist. You make a pretense of being there and I turn around, you're not there. Your love is not there. He says, you're like the, the morning dew. Have you ever got up early in the morning and walked through some, some about waist high grass till your britches got soaked? You ever, you ever done that? Come on, we live in the country. Come on. I'm, I, I'm not the only one here. Come on, boys. Come on, girls. Yeah. You walk through some waist high grass, your britches are soaked, and, and, then, and then just like just like that, all of a sudden all the grass is dry and your britches are still wet. Stinks. But this is what he says. He says, What, what am I supposed to do with you, Israel? What am I supposed to do with you, Judah? Because you say you love me, but your love for me, your pro protestation of love, your profession of great love for me is like fog in the morning. I think it's there and it's gone. It's like dew on the grass. I think it's going to last. There it is. Up. Oh, it's gone. Your love is fickle. Love to be genuine, to know and seek Him means we dig in and we say, God, I'm all in. Love is patient and kind, is not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not puff up, does not seek its own. It never fails. It never ends. That kind of love for our God. Here a week ago, I was sharing with some brothers in my, my accountability group. I'd been reading in, uh, in, uh, in the history literature of the Old Testament. I was reading about Absalom. I was reading in 2 Samuel when Absalom was seeking the kingdom and trying to overthrow his, throw his dad. That's a happy day when uh, your son tries to usurp the throne and tries to kill you. Kill you. You know what, when your kids are trying to kill you, it's, not a, it's, it's a no good, very bad day. And David has to flee, and he flees before all of Israel and runs, and the mighty men go with him. And as the mighty men, he and the mighty men are leaving Jerusalem. Here comes Ittai the Gittite. Ittai the Gittite. And David says to Ittai, Ittai, you just, you just came. Uh, I can't promise you we're going to get through this. I can't promise you we're going to return. I can't promise you anything, buddy. I got nothing. I can't promise you nothing. You might as well wait right here and see what, what, what shakes out, my friend. And Ittai, the Gittite, Ittai says, O king, live or die, I'm with you. Live or die, I'm all in. 
That's what God wants. He wants us to say, hey, God, live or die. <laughs> I'm all in. Doesn't matter. Doesn't have to be peaches and cream. Doesn't always have to be sweet and nice. Doesn't always have to be comfortable. Doesn't always have to be easy. God, I'm all in. God says, what am I supposed to do with you? You make a great noise about following me. But you're like fog in the morning. You're like dew on the grass. I want a love that's constant. God says, you say you love me. Where are you? God's actions... Verse 5, verse 5, the words of the prophet cut them in pieces. He says, this is what God did. He, he gave them another opportunity. So he took them to the woodshed and brought correction into their lives. The word of God brings to light uh, the reality of what our lives are. And, and the truth of that is that it ends the pretense in our life. And that correction came like lightning, like lightning. There's no escaping the truth of God, the word of God, the will of God. God's arm is not short. It is mighty to care for us and it is mighty to correct us. So this is what he says in verse 6. This is my desire. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire knowledge, not ritual. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God's desire is for us to practice faith love, a mercy for him, a commitment that pays a price. New American Standard, which is one of my favorite translations, the New American Standard translates this, my desire is loyalty, loyalty, not sacrifice. I desire loyalty, not sacrifice. God's desire is for loyal followers, not routine keepers. His desire is for loyal followers, not pretenders. His desire is for loyal followers, not for appearance makers. His desire is for people who loyally and faithfully follow Him, who with all and every aspect of the conversation of their lives, they are devoted to Him, and every aspect of all of life is, is engaged in their walk with God. Loyalty. The story is told of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was conquering the world and he, he was left with a handful of men. He had a handful of men, uh, was, uh, was, was encamped outside of a great walled city. Uh, the number of uh, opponents within the walled city were greatly outnumbered uh, Alexander's troops. And Alexander uh, um, had a, uh, treated with the, uh, with the king of the, uh, of, of, of the city. And he said... Uh, I'll accept your unconditional surrender. And the king laughed at him. And he said, what do you think those few men can do against this great walled city? He said, let me show you. And he commanded his men to start marching. And when 10 had marched over the cliff to their death, he told them to stop. And the king recognized a loyalty he'd never seen and a determination that would never stop and surrender the city. Loyalty. Now that's uh, grisly loyalty. But God's desire is for mercy, loyal following, a devotion to Him. Not multiplied routines and sacrifices and rituals. God's desire is that we know Him. Not that we engage in rituals. God's desire is that we press on to know Him. That's what the whole of Scripture is about. All of the Bible reveals God. God wants us to know Him. The Hebrews thought, hey God, you make a really good vending machine. We can put our quarter in and get what we want. And God says, no, I'm not a vending machine. You don't drop your quarter in and get what you want. I'm God. My desire is that you know me. I don't desire rituals or sacrifices, celebrations or festivals, offerings or good works. I want your heart. And when God's got your heart, God gives you life. It's incredible. 1904, 1905. 
there was a great revival in Wales, the Welsh revivals. You can read about them and there's some incredible stories. I, I've loved reading different things. Evan Roberts was at the heartbeat and centerpiece of that. Evan Roberts was a ministry student in 1904, came home to his home church and the pastor said, hey, if you want to speak this evening after service, if anyone will stay, you can speak after church. Seventeen people stayed. And they preached on the need for revival. And they prayed, and they prayed till 2 a.m. And before the week was out, 60 people had come to Christ. It was great. Now, how, how cool would that be? Would that not be amazing? That would be a blessing to us, would it not? If, if next week we had 60 professions of faith, would that be okay? That would be stinking awesome. Let's, let's get real. That'd be stinking awesome. But that's just where it started. In 18 months... In Wales, over one million people came to Christ. Now, I want to set that in context for you. Do you know what the population of Wales was in 1904? Two million people. Fifty percent of the nation turned to God in 1904. Now, there's some incredible things that happened in that time. In uh, Wales and in England in that time, they had professional soccer leagues. They still have pro professional soccer leagues. They had professional soccer leagues and they had stadiums that seated well over 100,000. And every Sunday, they, they fi filled them to capacity. But in 1904, 1905, the soccer league closed down because no one came. Everybody went to church. And so the soccer league didn't function because of church, not because of COVID, because of church. Amazing things transpired in those days. Um, something I read this week that I had never read. In those 18 months, they disbanded the police because no one did anything wrong. Uh, for two weeks, the coal mines had to shut down because the mules didn't know how to respond when all the miners got saved and no one was cursing at them and cussing them anymore. And it took two weeks to retrain the mules. In 18 months, there was one case that went to court. One case. One person did something against the law in 18 months. That one person appeared before the judge, was broken and repentant, and the judge led him to Christ. And the jury sang a hymn, and they went out. Is that not crazy? No, that's God. No, that's God. That's when one person says, no, it's serious, let's get after it. And somehow 17 people join him and say, yeah, let's seek his face. And the next thing you know, God does amazing. If you're looking for amazing and seeking amazing, you'll look for a lifetime. But if you seek him and long for him, you'll be surprised by amazing. God wants us to, with all that we are, be His. Live or die. I'm all in, God. Our musician's going to come. We're going to sing our hymn of decision. As God speaks and moves in our fellowship, it is a holy and a wondrous thing when the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts and our lives. If the Spirit of God has spoken to you of your need of a Savior today, you understand sin has alienated you, separated you from God. You need a Savior. You want Christ to take charge of your life. I'd love to pray with you to receive Christ today. I invite you to come in just a moment as we stand and sing. If you have just a burden on your heart, something you want to take to the Father, the altar is open, should you desire to come and pray. If you want someone to pray with you, I would delight to have the opportunity to pray with you today. So as we stand, as we sing, as the Spirit of God speaks to our lives, would you listen to what the Holy Spirit says? And would you respond to Him today?
in obedience as we stand and sing. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me, O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. My heart shall be thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary, my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him my all. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while. Fresh treasure, the light of his smile. Seeking the lost ones, he died to Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give henceforth to live. For thee
hey guys, been a joy and delight to be together today. Hey, uh, you may have noticed we have a little bit different appearance here on the platform this morning. Uh, we are beginning an online revival tonight, uh, 7 o'clock. I'm going to preach a, kind of an introductory message over the Beatitudes. And then uh, we're going to hear eight different voices for the, for the next couple of weeks. We're going to launch the first four Beatitudes uh, Monday, uh, every, every evening, Monday through Thursday at 7 o'clock. We'll launch a new Beatitude. Then it'll be available for you at any time to view online. Um, uh, so you can view that. Uh, it launches at 7, and we're going to look at the first four Beatitudes. Next Sunday night, we're going to have a panel of those four individuals talking to us and dr trying to drill down and dig a little deeper in those Beatitudes, and uh, that will be our evening worship time. Uh, then the next week, we will look at the next four Beatitudes. I'm excited about, uh, about what you're going to hear. You're going to hear, uh, hear God's Word in different voices. I think you'll have a real treat, a real blessing. I want to invite you to to join us and to be a part of our online revival uh, in the next uh, Monday through Thursday this week and Monday through Thursday next week. Brian, anything you want to share with us this morning? Uh, Tater? Yes. Hey, Adopt a college student ministry here. And uh, I know many of you are familiar with that. Some of you might not be. But so just real quick, what it is is it provides an opportunity for some of our church families to get to know some of our college students here and connect with them and to host them, provide a meal for them, to pray for them and those type of things and allow college students to connect with some of the families here at church. We do have online an opportunity for you to sign up. If you'd like to possibly do that as a college student or as a host family, go online, you can sign up and we will get a hold of you and let you know a little bit more about that. So adopt a college student. That's what it is. Be a great time cross-generationally to walk in Jesus together. It's a great opportunity, great time. You'll want to volunteer before I volunteer you uh, to be a part of this ministry. Several were voluntold last week, so. <laughs> pray for us. I will. Here. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for an opportunity to have come together to worship you. Lord, it is our desire to know you, not just to know about you, and not to only seek the blessings that come from knowing you. But Lord, I, I ask that our hearts would be focused on you and growing in our knowledge and our love of you, Father, that so, so that when difficult days come and we understand they come, that Lord, we, we are rooted in our love and our faith in you when Things around us are, are struck, or seem to be falling apart at times or in the lives of others around us. God, we can stand firm in our love for you and our devotion to you. God, we are abundantly blessed. Help us to, uh, God, to, to focus on the blesser, the one who is given. I pray as we go to our time of Bible study in Sunday school, you speak to us through your word there. And then this upcoming week, God, that we... I would just walk with you in a close, intimate way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.